I'm Tim. I'm Chris. I'm Sarah. And this week, as it must come to all men, Cinema Spection comes to Charles Foster Kane as we discuss Citizen Kane. Charles Foster Kane is... Sure, he started the war. But do you think if it hadn't been for Mr. Kane, the United States would have the Panama Canal? Charles Foster Kane is nothing more or less than a communist! Kane, governor. Listen, when the voters of this state and Mrs. Kane learn what I found out about Mr. Kane and a certain little blondie named Susan Alexander, he couldn't be elected dog catcher. I'm going to skin Mr. Charles Foster Kane alive. I'm going to marry him next week at the White House. Emily, I hear you've been stepping out with Charlie Kane. I... Of course I love him. I gave him $60 million. Well, of course I love him. He's the richest man in America. That was a bit from the trailer, and that's right, tonight we're discussing what many consider the best motion picture ever made, Citizen Kane. Kind of a tall order. A lot of times when you come to this type of movie, you're told, oh, this is important, this is great, this is, you know, this momentous. This means something. It's momentous in the history of motion pictures. And then you actually see them, and you're like, oh, holy shit, it really is. It really actually does live up to all the hype that you've heard about it. And that's, I mean, a very true statement. I, I, you, know, you have your cynics out there, of course. You know, black and white as a, I won't call it a genre, black and white as, you know, just the state of film at the time. A lot of people nowadays, they just write it completely off. You know, I won't even see it because it just, it bores me. You know, and you could never, I couldn't see anyone ever saying that about this film. There's rarely a time where the camera isn't moving or staged in a way that is just completely uncharacteristic of any movie at that moment in time. And, uh... I, I put it right up there. I mean, I haven't seen much um, in, in the grand scheme of what's out there, but I would put this right at the top of the list. This movie is just, it's technically, script-wise, acting-wise, um, makeup, you know, you, you add it all up. It's It's got to be, just for defining how movies like this were made, if there even is other movies like this, you know? So that's that's kind of my take on that. Sarah, coming at it from, you know... This was your first time seeing it, yeah. what did you think? I like I thought it was really good. I, I finally get to know what the sled and rosebud is all about. We should probably mentioned, yeah, we're going to be discussing this in detail, but I mean, everybody knows this. Spoiler movie. alert! Well, <laughs> spoiler alert! It's big spoiler is pretty much a joke now throughout pop culture, so it's kind and of... And the movie, kind of I, I mean, you know, to say that, right, it's the defining thing of the movie, but it could have been anything. It doesn't have, like, the movie could have been staged, it could have been, you know, a lucky rabbit's foot. You know, it could have been this or that. It's, you know, the MacGuffin, as it were. It doesn't matter. Uh, the story The story's about this man and kind of how the um, quote-unquote American dream and the direction it takes him in. Yeah, they could you know, never it, have revealed what Rosebud is, and the film is still the film. It's still amazing. Yeah. Well, we'll get a little bit more into Rosebud a little further down the line. Let's go over a few facts. The movie was released by RKO Pictures way back on January 1st, 1941, amid a whole storm of controversy that we'll get into. The budget was anywhere between $630,000 to $800,000. Figures vary on Which that. is over 100 times more than Clerks <laughs> cost. <laughs> and this is in 1941 dollars. Uh, it took in about a million and a half, which, you know, seems like more than the budget, but was kind of a disappointment because RKO was struggling at the time. This was supposed to be their big breakout hit. Uh, was nominated for nine Oscars, including Best Picture, Best Actor for Orson Welles, and Best Director for Orson Welles, Cinematography for Greg Tolan, Art Direction, Film Editing by Robert Wise, uh, The Score by Bernard Herrmann, Sound. It would only win for Best Original Screenplay. I mean, a lot of... Well, deserving, but... Uh, very well, Deserving of a lot more, but again, as we'll get into it, there was a lot of backlash against this film. Uh, it went to John Ford's How Green Was My Valley. Which is also very good. Never even but, heard of it. But notice it doesn't yeah. show up in the top 100 best films ever made, right? It's no, like, it's, it doesn't. It's quite a good have movie. The historical no. import that Citizen Kane does. But all right, let's get into the cast. Uh, first of all, Orson Welles is Charles Foster Kane, also co-writer, director. This was his first shot at the bat. I mean, after his distinguished career in theater and, of course, in radio, given carte blanche, they said. Do what you want with this film. He had complete directorial control, had final cut. I mean, we, we had just been talking about this right after it ended. What a ballsy move, right? Your, your first time on the scene as far as people seeing you, you know, on camera. You know, your voice is very well known, this and that. Not only does he put himself in a role that I wouldn't call him 
unrecognizable, but he's all over the place. His age changes multiple times throughout the movie. The makeup work on him is incredible. The Orson Welles you see at the beginning isn't even the same guy you see at the end. His mannerisms, the way that Doesn't he acts. It seem like it's two different actors. Right. This isn't like, you know, a Brad Pitt tentpole kind of a movie where, oh, look, it's dashing man on camera. It's, you know, this is Orson Welles playing a experimental art kind of a role where it's, you know, this is more a caricature of a specific person or a specific type of guy in America. And I don't think people would show up to see that if it was billed that way. Do you know what I mean? To see it for Orson Welles, even though Orson Welles is, you know, such a well-known guy leading up to that. And I think his acting was great because he's able to make you really like him when he first starts as the character and then he completely changes throughout the movie where it's almost like a completely different actor and, and you, you hate him and you're like, wow, he's an ass. Yeah, he starts off as the dashing crusader and then kind of becomes the thing he's crusading against and becomes this controlling... Gets out of control It's almost like him. He, his character gets physically ugly too. Yeah, like what's happening like inside. Like he's a good looking guy and, and, you know, the women swoon and then as he gets more of an asshole, he becomes less attractive. On top it's that of you, it. he is making up for every, you know, there is no him. There's no guy anymore. It's all, what can I throw money at to make me? This now defines me. Whereas before it was, I don't even have to be this, ma the paper isn't getting sold because it's Charles Foster Kane selling the paper. This paper is going to get sold because of what we print, you know, and it becomes all about him and how he can get people to pay attention to him, even though he's doing nothing for them other than giving them something to love about him. In the modern sense, he becomes a brand. He becomes, he becomes his a own brand, brand. Exactly. Yeah. Uh, going back to Wells himself, I mean, this is also his chance to introduce the world to the Mercury Theater, the group that he had worked through on Broadway and then in the radio. He had started with the uh, Federal Theater Project, and he met uh, some of the Mercury players like John Hausman and um, Joseph Cotton. He played the Shadow for uh, actually only That's one right. year, but it was an iconic year. He's just so great as that character, and a lot of the people who were in this movie pop up on that radio show as well. And then, of course, with Mercury Theater, he did War of the Worlds, and that's what got Hollywood's attention when he put together this amazing radio show that simulated War of the Worlds as a news broadcast and apparently scared the hell out of everybody. And, you know, watching this movie, knowing that now, right, and knowing just being able to look at this man's entire career and know where he came from, when you get those little bits about Charles Foster Kane taking over the radio and the country, I, I get, you know, that feeling of, oh man, it's so obvious how a person like this could, this character could have been that version of Orson Welles that could have tried to pull something like that. I mean, when you see Charles Foster Kane running for politics, it's like a, a communist or like, almost like a Nazi, like super villain, like thing where, where everybody's just in there and it, you, they should, could be, you know, hail Kane is almost coming <laughs> out of that. And it's, this is not the man he set out to be at all. And it's, it's kind of terrifying. Uh, to see the character go there. That was, was kind of a tangent, but man, it, it's... It's... On all levels, this movie is functioning. I also couldn't help notice the subtle joke that when he's being interviewed at one point, he's like, don't trust everything you hear on the radio, which I gotta wonder if that was a little nod yep. to that. And it's kind of a shame, because this is the last time he'd have that kind of control in the movie. Everything he'd do after this, uh, from Magnificent Ambersons to uh, Journey to Fear, and especially uh, Touch of Evil, would somehow be compromised. The studio would re recut it, they wouldn't allow him to do what he wanted or cast the people he wanted. So this was his only shot at really proving what he could do without constraints. And he just does an incredible job with it. Also in the cast, we have Joseph Cotton as Jedediah Leland. Great, great actor, this guy. And another one that, you know, transcends the, the makeup changes, the age. Um, you know, he and has the that... And character changes, too. The, and the character changes, exactly. You know, he he comes in, like, with the same thing, all excited, rip-roaring out of college. Obviously, this guy's roommate, he obviously, you can tell, was just completely sucked in by the ambition of this guy and just wants to go full bore into it. And you can see that, you know, that drives him to drink mm -hmm. and just drives him to be not a great person himself. He gets, you know, Kane before pretty much anyone else, it would seem, gets the whole, you know, uh, he's trying to bring the love in from everybody else without really giving them anything in return. And, you know, I, I got a vibe from him. I don't know. This comes up. You can, you can get it from, you know, your your Sherlock Holmes and Watson. And the movies can play nowadays, especially you can do little winks. But you almost get a little bit of almost like a an un, um, undirected, like, love 
almost at times, where it's like at the beginning, he's kind of like, you know, following him around, almost like he just wants to make him proud. You know, I'd like, I should be over there on travel with him. Why can't I be there? You know, kind of stuff. And that gets soiled just like all of his other relationships with everybody else. And I found that very interesting too. The idea of them as college roommates, yeah, you get the sense of them as rascals who are having fun and idealistic and, oh, we're going to go out and change the world and it's great. And you can chart how it slowly starts to slip after he loses the election because of his affairs, and the, the next shot is Leland going into a bar. And from there on, he starts drinking more. He's a lot more bitter. And, and Leland saw there wasn't weight to it anymore. This this guy, since he was kind of put on attack, you know, life, he didn't earn any of this. He was put on, you're told to do this. He's just going to continue having fun and blowing it all away, almost like, um, you know, you get the same sort of excess like you get out of The Great Gatsby hmm. or... Um, uh, more DiCaprio movies. Oh, the Wolf of Wall uh, Street. Wolf of Wall Street. You know, and like you said, you know, the scene where they celebrate, you know, he decides, you know what, why does the best paper in town have, you know, the best circulation? Oh, because they have the best people working for them. Well, I'll just buy them. And then the big celebration he has, you know, this little, like, um, dancing girls show. But like you said, originally he's supposed to be in a brothel, and that kind of plays into that even more. It's like, I'm not really in this for anything other than just because I can. But even there, Leland is the first one to know, well, okay, if these guys believed in the Chronicles' yes. perceptions, how are they going to change Kane? How, how is that going to affect and they did. their honesty and their integrity if they're employing, you know, the basically the army of the enemy? Cotton has an amazing career. He worked with Wells with the Mercury Theater. Uh, he'd starred for Wells again as an actor in Magnificent Ambersons and The Third Man, which has another of Wells' great, great We We roles. need to do that one. We do need to do that one eventually. Uh, one of my favorite roles of his is from Alfred Hitchcock's Shadow of a Doubt, where he plays Uncle Charlie the Serial Killer. He's just terrifying in that one. Uh, he was also in Gaslight, and even appears in some really crazy horror movies in the 70s, like The Abominable Dr. Fives with Vincent Price and Lady mm-hmm. Frankenstein, of all things. Wow. Great, great career. Brings us to Everett Sloan as Mr. Bernstein. It's interesting, we never know him as anything but Mr. Bernstein in the movie. He's always referred to by Kane that way. Also worked with the Mercury Theater and would pop up with Wells in Lady from Shanghai. Appeared as a doctor assisting veterans in uh, The Men with Marlon Brando. And is in a really great Twilight Zone episode, The Fever. He plays an addicted gambler who's haunted by a slot machine. Bernstein, you know, great character. Also from the beginning, he kind of had that as-you-wish master Mm -hmm. kind of attitude towards him but you could see in the background when people would be rumbling about is this really smart what he's doing or anything and he goes of course it's not but it's charles foster kane this is what he's gonna do he's totally loyal he's kind of the total fan to the end he believes in kane even when you can see un- underneath the surface he knows bad things are happening even when he's talking about him in the interview in the future he presents him as he presents him as the caricature and not as the guy mm-hmm. You know, and he's and the whole scene is dominated by this giant portrait he has of Kane over his head. Like even now, the specter of it is still looming over this guy. But we also see how he protects Jedediah too. He's like, no, he, well, he never used to drink this much before. I mean, no, by that point, once Jedediah is on his downward spiral, yeah, he's probably drinking. He's all the, the PR time. guy between all of them. Yeah. he's the he's the glue. I think keeping it all afloat somehow. And you get the sense he's really sad about how their trio has fallen apart over time. That it's not quite what it used to be when they were all idealistic and out to save the world and help the common man and everything. Dorothy Cummingore as Susan Alexander Kane, who... At times she's kind of grading the movie, but you really feel for it by the end. She really gets put by the, with, the, in the, the ringer. The emotional sequences that she has where she's talking about their life, in the bar especially, she's... Perfect. The the um the neediness of her trying to like push Kane. Those are the times when it gets grating. But it, you know what? It kind of has to be. But she makes a point though. She's right. Yeah. She doesn't yeah, do anything she's... she wants. She's like locked in a castle. And she's totally she's just... she can be whiny about it, but she's making a very good point. Absolutely. And yeah, exactly. He's decided that she's going to be a singer, so it doesn't even matter if she wants to be one. He, you know, this is the world he's creating. And when their affair is exposed, she's the one's like, what about me? She knows once this goes out, she's going to be on every newspaper everywhere. Her life is pretty much ruined now unless she ends up with this guy. They get married. It's almost like she has no choice by that point. And I mean, that's great use of the metaphor and the way that people are dressed and the way that scenes are framed and the way that shadows come in and lighting. You know, their wedding, like their whole wedding starts with a riot. When they're coming out, there's like people with police pushing them back because they're pissed at this woman. You know what I mean? And she gets into the car to drive away and she's in all black. She looks like she just came from a funeral. You know, and we did the Maltese Falcon. You know, and it's the same thing with the, you know, the wife who's, it's almost like it's, 
it's just that play on it's like well, the wife in that movie is just in it for days on end like you know it's just you know after a while it's like kind of comical you know and in this one they just got married this is supposed to be happy and everything about it is dark and Kane's the one laughing and she kind of even has this look of like oh this isn't starting out all that well on her face it's crazy she her character is loosely based on Marion Davies who as we'll get into it since the whole movie is based on the life of William Randolph Hearst. Davies was his mistress, who was an actress herself. And um, the fact that her performance kind of reflects badly on Davies really unfortunately affected Comingor's career after this. Um, Hearst did as much as he could to slander her, um, had her labeled a communist sympathizer because she supported desegregation and unionization. Eventually she got blacklisted, and that was pretty much the end of her acting career. Wow. It's such a shame because she's so good in this. She is. I mean, when you see her turn from this kind of naive, sweet, innocent girl to this drunk, completely dispirited woman living in a bar, just begging for another drink and another drink. And I love the detail that when she's performing at this bar, she bills herself as Susan Alexander Kane, even though she hates this period of her life, she's still desperate enough that she'll cash in on it when she can. We have Ruth Warwick as Emily Kane, his first wife. Uh, she would also appear in Journey into Fear by Orson Welles and uh, Song of the South for Disney. Uh, her biggest thing was uh, acting in soap operas. She appeared on Guiding Light, As the World Turns, Peyton Place, and had a 25-year run on All My Children as uh, the character of Phoebe Tyler. So, <gasps> huge, was huge it? career. Yep. What the character? first wife. She was the first wife. And I've watched All My Children all my life. But uh, I, I didn't even notice. Of wow. all the characters, she, I think, kind of maintains her dignity the most in the movie. She does. Know? There's no... She, she kind of splits while the getting is good, and e even, like, with the sun and the... You know, it, she, she, yeah, she, complete dignity maintained. She, she cleans slate, just breaks away from him and is like, I'm not letting this guy control me anymore, and just walks away. Over that great kind of breakfast table montage, we see her slowly turn the way her attitude and her posture slowly Until changes. at the very last one, she's reading the, uh, the rival newspaper. Uh, it's so I found it kind of odd, though, too, that they didn't show that she's like pregnant or ever had a kid. It was just them having the, the problems, and then they're at the, his rally, and all of a sudden there's a kid, and you're like, wait a minute. But and, they and say it earlier, but you think they would have referenced it then. Well, one could almost interpret that as maybe that's how Kane kind of perceives them as they're less important. The, they're the they, wife and when son. they mentioned it, they're like, oh, and like, they don't even say when they had a son, it's just his his wife and son died. Mm -hmm. Like, you're supposed to know there was a son there before well, you and, and glance over it. But it's, it's, it's cool, because... You get that reaction to it, and I think that's exactly what the movie's going for. It's the way Tim said it. It's like, Kane doesn't give a crap, and then the person telling the story at that moment in time, that wouldn't be a key detail for them either. I think that was Susan's story at that point, right? I believe so, but it's like they're the people who get kind of lost to history. Yeah, they exactly. Are just a footnote and never really examined very much, so it's important that in her few scenes she really makes an impression, and she does. The confrontation with uh, Jim Geddes... She knows it's pointless, but she's struggling to get Kane to, like, relent and give up his campaign and try to save his family and his son's reputation. And, and he's too deep. But she knows at the same time, like, no, I've, it's, this is never going to happen, that this is the end of it right there. That brings us to Ray Collins as Jim Geddes, Kane's political opponent, also worked in the Mercury Theater, and uh, was famous as playing Commissioner Weston on the old Shadow radio oh, show. Oh, right. He's best known, though, for playing Lieutenant Tragg on Perry Mason, the old legal drama. He had a huge career doing wow. that. Uh, doesn't have a huge part here, but he managed to make this guy, on the one hand, he's despicable because we get the sense that Kane's uh, allegations that he's this corrupt politician are true. But oh, and, he, and he acknowledges it. He acknowledges it. it. He's kind of upfront with it. And when he uh, says that, you know, I, well, I have to do this because I don't like my son seeing you draw cartoons of me in prison garb displayed on your newspaper. It's There's page. a gentlemanly way to handle this. And it, that, that parallels with a lot of the stuff we saw in the Maltese Falcon. And it's all in this movie, you know. Even when they're getting into fights and booting people out and arguing about it, Kane will be putting on the guy's jacket while he's basically telling me, I'd strangle you to death right now if I could. You know, basically the words coming out of his mouth. But he's still helping the guy put his jacket on, Very handing him a cigar. Yeah. It still had that gentlemanly way about this just isn't the right way to, like, don't shoot me outside in front of my family. You know, kind of like attitude. You know, do it with dignity. You know, <laughs> it says something that this dirty politician can look at Kane and go, you're not playing right. You're, you're breaking the rules on this one. That reflects how far down Kane has gone by this point. And next we have Agnes Moorhead as Mary Kane. Uh, as you pointed out, best known as playing Andorra on Bewitched. Didn't even look like her. Like, I know. Like the so, woman that played the Wicked Witch. She's so young. She did, yeah. actually. You're right. It was, it was Margaret a, Hamilton. Margaret yeah, Hamilton. Yeah, she looked yeah. more like Margot Hamilton than herself. Um, she also played Margot Lane on the uh, Shadow Radio show. 
compared to where the Orson Welles again. Uh, she'd appear in Hush Hush Sweet Charlotte with Betty Davis and again with Joseph Cotton. Dark Passage with Humphrey Bogart, which we'll have to watch. He's great in that one. And uh, one of my favorite Twilight Zone episodes, The Invaders, where she plays this woman in a farmhouse being attacked by tiny little aliens. My no dialogue. favorite Twilight Zone yeah. episode. Has absolutely no dialogue I've never in it, seen but she's it, superb. So. I will not even blow the twist of that. But if it's their favorite online, it's my favorite. Yeah, it's, uh... <laughs> uh, yeah, died of cancer, unfortunately, due to radioactive exposure from the set of The Conqueror, the John Wayne movie, oh. where they filmed it right near where the nuclear tests were done and it oh, contaminated the land sad. and the food. She was just incredibly talented. And this is interesting. The lead reporter, who we never really see the face of, uh, is played by William Aland. Uh, Aland or Aland, I'm not sure. Uh, who was an actor and a director, but is best known as a producer. He produced It Came From Outer Space, mm. uh, Creature From the Black Lagoon, and This Island Earth. Really amazing sci-fi producer. He's the one going around listening to everyone. Asking stories. all the questions, yeah. And one and of the reporters... Really see- What's that? And you don't really see him, that's right. Not really. Um, he's often in shadow a lot, yeah, too. I, I think which... there's another reason for that I'll get into in a bit. But And uh, one of the reporters in the last scene, the one with the pipe, is actually Alan Ladd, the star of Shane. And uh, did a lot of great film noirs like This Gun for Hire, The Blue Dahlia, The Glass Key, worked a lot with Veronica Lake. Tiny little part, and you, he barely has any dialogue, but he is in there. For some of Wells' other collaborators, we have, uh, here's the big one, for cinematography, Greg Tolan, who just revolutionized film photography with this movie. This was one of the first big ones to really utilize deep focus, or as he called it, pan focus at the time, where everything in the foreground and background, everything can be in sharp focus using special lenses, film stock, and lighting to make this one combined, incredibly deep image. And some of the photography and individual shots in this are just breathtaking, even now. It is, and I mean, and I think even in color it would look breathtaking, but especially in black and white with the usage of the grays and the blacks and the white. The film has these beautiful tracking shots, beautiful zooms. Um, Every time we enter the club that Susan is in for any of her interviews, whether it's daytime, nighttime, coming back out, coming in, they always go up through the sign and down through the glass top window. That's like a, um, oh, I'm going to mess up with names right now. The guy that made Seven. David Fincher? David Fincher. That's like his like signature move, right? Through keyholes, through walls. And this movie does it a whole bunch of times. And I don't think any movie from the time period I've seen has ever done that or even attempted it. Not with this level of quality. I mean, they used a lot of models that would split just as the camera was but approaching this was them. Different. The camera would pop you know, through and... Yeah. Th- this was different, and I mean, even like the the first approach on the Kane house. Well, that's all you know. It's a matte painting. But you mentioned right as the opening credits were going, it, it, it's obvious once you look at it. Every single time there's a um, a cut or a, a fade in between the images that they're showing, the light right in the window of Kane's bedroom is always in the same exact location on the screen. And that, it, it's a zoom without it being a zoom. And it, what it's giving you in key shots is telling you everything you need to know about this property. There's a big castle-like house up on a hill. There's a golf Zanadu. course. Xanadu, as it were, which is not a roller skating place. <laughs> um, or dance club. But uh, the... Um, you know, he's got a zoo. It, all, all this stuff that you, you learn so much about him even without even knowing what you're getting into yet. And or, or the shot right after where we're outside the window, there's a change in the light and all of a sudden, boom, we're inside the room with Kane right in the foreground. And that's in, like with the, the dancing girls sequence. They come and put hats on the guys. And almost in the same shot, the camera is complete 180 opposite and the hats come off and now it's behind the girls. Mm-hmm. And it, it's so well done. Or you were talking about the you know shots moving through objects. It's kind of subtle. The first scene inside the um, Kane homestead when his parents are going to send him away. The camera starts looking through the window at uh, Charles outside, pulls back through the room following Agnes Moorhead as she walks through and would basically have to go through a table to get the angle that they do. And uh, they had all this furniture split apart, closed right after the camera had passed it. You can actually just see it as she sits at the table. There's a hat still shaking from where the table moved. But otherwise, it's seamless to the point where you don't even know. So you just accept, okay, this... Nowadays, it would just be a camera on a pole arm being pulled back, but they couldn't right. do that back then. And there's a lot, also a lot of you know angles pointed straight up, especially during the scene after the election when um, Jedediah and Kane are just walking through the office, which was a bit of a problem because RKO sets didn't really have ceilings, so they'd actually have to take fabric, stretch it over the top of the set to simulate the ceiling. And, of course, in uh, that particular scene, to get that low angle, they had to dig a trench in the set to get the camera low enough to get just the right angle that Wells was looking for. And that's that classic, uh, 
argument you see in the making of film, RKO 281, over, no, we're not digging into the floor. <laughs> I also noticed there's a lot of cameras looking up at characters like Kane and Leland and then looking down at, like, uh, Susan Alexander. The lower characters yeah. in Kane's mind. The movie almost took his... The ones who are less powerful. Less yeah. powerful. Uh, Tolan, uh, besides this one, he worked on Mad Love, great movie with uh, cinematographer turned director Carl Freund. Dead End and The Best Years of Our Lives for William Wyler, uh, The Long Voyage Home and The Grapes of Wrath for John Ford, all of which are just amazingly gorgeous looking movies. He was nominated for five Oscars, but never won. And you can see how important Wells considered his contribution since his credit for photography is right alongside Wells as writer-director. It's the last credit you see. And then Wells gives himself the last acting credit, <laughs> which I, I thought was great. <laughs> yeah, doesn't put himself in the kind of curtain call at the end of the movie, just throws himself in with everybody else. Yeah, with. <laughs> that was, he was the last on the with. Well, he was humble, apparently. Uh, apparently um, not so much. Yes or no. It's yeah. Like the fact that in the trailer we never actually see him, we see everybody else, but everything else about the movie would suggest otherwise, that Kane has a lot of Wells' egomaniacal characteristics written into him, too. True. Uh, the screenplay was written, of course, by Wells and Herman Mankiewicz. There's some debate about where the structure came from. Supposedly Mankiewicz had written a play about John Dillinger that looked at Dillinger from different points of view, and Wells loved the idea but not the idea of Dillinger as the subject. There was also a suggestion that it had been inspired by an earlier Preston Sturges movie called The Power and the Glory that kind of had the same similar structure too, although that's not really proven as of yet. But um, it's really kind of innovative, this idea of using flashbacks in this way, not just in terms of a character going, all right, here's what happened and we follow it chronologically, but no, we're going to follow everything from that character's point of view, get out, go into a new character, start at the beginning in some cases, move through again, get out, a different character. And, and a lot of it was very subtle, um, but it was still different. You know, every character had, you know, Kane is worse in certain people's tellings of the story than in others. He's still, the, the arc is still the same, right? But, you know, he kind of gets a better rap in maybe Cotton's story. You know what I mean? Then you get into the, the Susan story, and he's almost like an otherworldly, like Sarah was saying, his his mannerisms, his ugliness, his old kind of feeble. You don't get that side of the character because that's when he was locked away with just her and Xanadu, you know? And other movies, like The Hero, for instance, took that whole concept to a completely different degree where you're going to hear three versions of the story or four versions of the story, and each time they're going to be less and less fanciful till you get the real story. And um, th this one did that a lot more subtle, but it's the same idea. You're you're getting a jumbled, out-of-order telling, and it's it's just very well handled. And yeah. also uh, where each character chooses to remember them. Like Bernstein remembers the good old days when they were all together and happy. And Cotton he, remembers a little of that. Yeah, but, but also then... up to the point where he was fired, um, Susan Alexander, of course, by necessity, would be mostly the bad times. Uh, of course, the, the big question is, you know, how much of this is based on William Randolph Hearst's life, the newspaper tycoon that Mankiewicz had had some familiarity with. He used to go to some of his parties and supposedly got kicked out for being too drunk. Uh, there's also suggestions. There's a, some Howard Hughes in the character as well, and um, that would the Xanadu stuff would definitely bring you right yeah, right to that and yeah. the paranoia and uh, a holding company tycoon named Samuel Insel, who the opera house kind of anecdote, the idea of building the opera house for his girlfriend, supposedly came from that. Mankiewicz had reviewed um, a production financed for his wife Gladys Wallace Insel, and supposedly what Jedediah's review, where he's you know drunken and writes this. <laughs> Scathing review. Some of that came from what Mankiewicz had written about that particular performance. Oh, jeez. Uh, and Mankiewicz supposedly included a lot of Wells' traits, his bad temper, his egotism, into Kane as well. So I wonder if Wells was aware of that and he just went with it, or if he wasn't didn't quite see it. Well, maybe it has a little bit of the um, Kane bit in Wells where he finishes that review after seeing what Cotton really thought about the play and thought about him as almost like a dig at him, like, oh, you really don't think that I'll let you publish this? I'm just going to go and do it because you need to love me. And maybe that's kind of the same way. Maybe with the Manko, it's writing it a little bit more about Wells. Wells is like, well, you know what? I'm going to call his bluff and I'm going to suck it up and just be that guy that he wants me to be, you know, or at least on screen at that time. Well, that gets into the interesting area that there was a huge dispute over the credits for the movie where... Supposedly, Mankiewicz wrote the first draft with help from John Hausman, who was mostly there to keep him from drinking, because Mankiewicz had a massive drinking problem at that point. But a lot of the publicity suggested Wells was, you know, the actor, writer, director, that he had done the whole thing. Uh, there's an essay by Pauline Kael, very controversial on Raising Cain, where she suggests 
Mankiewicz wrote the whole screenplay, and Wells didn't really contribute anything to it, although there's a lot of filmmakers, uh, and especially Peter Bogdanovich, who was a big uh, friend of Wells towards the end, who refute this and say that, no, Wells had a lot of input, he wrote a lot of notes and included a lot of his input into the film as well. And supposedly Mankiewicz said that Wells had offered him a cash bonus if he would decline credit and just let Wells take the whole credit for it. Wow, but Mankiewicz, that's very keen. It is very keen. <laughs> but Mankiewicz uh, opposed that, so they did share credit and both shared the Oscar when they won. I think, was did Mankiewicz get the first bill? I think he did. I think it was I Mankiewicz and Orson yeah. Wells, yeah. Which again raises that interesting idea of, you know, Wells puts himself low on the credit list, but, but is that really? But screenplay. is that also really just a? See, look, I'm humble. Modesty, I stuck yeah. myself low. I have a question, yeah. kind of off topic, but what was the globe? He was holding it in the beginning, and then he picks it up after he destroys well, the room. That, they never really show why that's significant. That's actually in what I think is significant about it, and um, we could talk about this, refute it, dispute it. Is the same place when we get into Rosebud that Rosebud came from? Is it was an thing from his childhood, a thing in the home from when he was a child. That's what I think it must have been, but they never really show you what was and in he it. Had, so it was like a snow globe, right? It was a snow globe. It was like a snowy cabin that looked a lot like his original And home. And he had said, um, you know, when he first, the first night he's with um, Susan, I have to go across town and pick up all the stuff from storage that they saved of my mother's. And that's, you know, first tie in, okay, the movie's first nod to maybe Rosebud is something from his childhood. The movie doesn't go into it, but that's, you know, where it all ties together. So maybe that globe was something of his mother's that he gave to Susan, because well, it was on Susan's dresser, and he smashed everything in the room, stopped at that, and kept that. This is the first time I noticed it's actually in Susan's apartment when he first meets her. Oh. He goes in for the first time. It's in the back, and you can see it on a shelf. So that's almost a, I really fucked this up. Almost or it could be just thing. that the image brought back memories of his childhood and he suddenly clutched at it and needed it. Because uh, that's what he's holding. That's he a good point. Yeah. Guys. You're right, you're right. But it, that brings up the interesting question. You have to ask, all right, who's the protagonist of this story? Your first impulse would be Cain, but we're always kind of at a remove from Cain. We never really know what powers him except for these little Yeah, no, no matter, powers. even after we get introspection into Cain, he's still that otherworldly, even to us, that... The big mogul that no one can touch, the the, the name that the product came. The enigma, you know? yeah. And it almost seems like the reporters kind of become our surrogates and they're the protagonists, that they're the ones out trying to solve this mystery for us. It's kind of, it's an interesting dramatic conceit I don't think I've really seen very much in other movies. Well, it's, it's almost like the narrative is the protagonist. <laughs> yeah. And yeah, that's, that's it. <laughs> the quest to find the truth is, is the big dramatic need, because... Otherwise, for Kane as a character, we don't really know what his dramatic need is specifically. Well, I, and I think that's we the have whole a lot point. Of yeah. I think that's the whole point. For the stuff that Leland says about his quest to, to be loved, to be, you know, that he even, needs respect. E even Rosebud as the, even maybe misdirection of, yeah, why why does he say it? It's mm -hmm. just He's just having a childhood memory, or maybe that was what was driving him the whole time, was to get something like that back that he just couldn't get. The movie doesn't answer that question. No, I, you know? I like that it it kind of messy. There was also, I thought, an interesting idea looking at Kane. You can almost see him as having a huge, colossal case of nice guy syndrome. This idea that, you know, a guy likes a girl, he'll do everything for her, buys her flowers, does all this nice stuff, and then thinks he's entitled to love or sex in return. Kane takes that to his whole reading audience. That he will stand up for the common man, and the common man has to love him for it. You just want to persuade people that you love them so much that they ought to love you back. Only you want love on your own terms. Something to be played your way according to your rules. And that when they don't, when, you know, as Leland points out, no, these people are going to be entitled to social justice and their rights. They don't expect them to be granted by you. He, you know, turns negative and becomes this angry, nasty person. Yeah. It almost fits that pattern. Also, it's kind of innovative in the opening newsreel scene almost foreshadows mockumentary filmmaking. This idea that we're going to give you all this exposition in this very realistic style that people from that time were aware of and, you know, used to with these news shorts. Hey, and then movies. they shit on it right afterwards. Yeah. The guy in the room just says, you, you almost get a whole movie. Like, that would have been enough. And then, you, like, you're right. That's like the the news really you would have seen before Citizen Kane in the yeah. theater. And the guy just says, this isn't good at all. This doesn't tell us anything about the guy. And then the movie you get still tells you nothing about the guy. But it also <laughs> brilliantly lays out the whole chronology right there for you. You get everything you kind of need to know, and then we'll have it embellished once we actually get to talk to you. You get the people. bullet points. Yeah, and then we get the truth behind it. 
to give it that aged look that it has that makes it so authentic. They Robert Wise, the editor, just took the film and ran along the concrete floor of the editing bay to scratch it up to the point where movie theaters were like, the film looks terrible. It's this Our print was damaged. It's yeah. that authentic and realistic. Yeah, bring along to some of the other themes, it does have that sense of the souring of the American dream, like that kind of saying that when you're young, you're idealistic, you're the Democrat, but as you get older, you become realistic and become the Republican. Well, and also, and Kane got all of that without, the, there's no scene where you see this kid sitting down as a boy and saying, you know, I want to get out of this life I'm in and go and, you know, be a big businessman in America. And you, it's all a joke to him. It's all not a joke, but it's all fun. It's all, it's all experimental. You know, he he got thrown into a life he didn't want. He waited till he was 25. Thatcher gave him everything any boy at that time could have ever wished for. Here's your, you know, shares of everything in this gold industry and all this other stuff we have. And he just wants to get rid of all of it and run a newspaper because he thinks it would be fun. And, you're right, you don't get that input into, does Kane have aspirations to do anything at all? Well, there is this kind of sense of self-loathing to it, too. Like he says when he's confronting Thatcher in the newsroom that, yes, you're talking to two people. As Charles Foster Kane, who owns 82,364 shares of public transit, preferred, you see, I do have a general idea of my holdings. I sympathize with you. Charles Foster Kane is a scoundrel. His paper should be run out of town. A committee should be formed to boycott him. You may, if you can form such a committee, put me down for a contribution of $1,000. My time's On the other I hand, I am the publisher of the Inquirer. As such, it's my duty, and I'll let you in on a little secret. It's also my pleasure to see to it that decent, hard-working people in this community aren't robbed blind by a pack of money-mad pirates just because they haven't anybody to look after their interests. He's a part of this system, and he hates it and wants to destroy it. Although, as time goes on, he becomes much more entrenched in the system that he hates and goes the other opposite well, There's a realization that there's no way out once you're in, almost. But he almost doesn't really have the realization. It subtly creeps in, and he just yeah. becomes this way without even really becoming aware of it. Uh, there's also this sense that the movie's about the unknowability of a person, that we can't, no matter how many testimonials we get, no matter how many little factoids, if we even get what Rosebud means, can we ever really know who Charles Foster Kane was? And I love the metaphor of the jigsaw puzzles, that we saw, yes. constantly see Susan putting them together. And that's basically what the movie we're getting. Tiny little fragments of the life, often out of order, that we have to put together and reassemble. And that that's another interesting thing. What exactly was he doing, why he existed, why he did what he did, is never really answered. But the the MacGuffin again there, Rosebud, getting burned at the end like a like trash, mm -hmm. you know, like a toy... Like all the jigsaw puzzles, oh, there's thousands of those in here. It's like, wow, she was really hard up on doing those jigsaw puzzles. She was really bored. He bought, twenty, and right in that scene, they're telling you, $25,000 sculptures, multiple um, Venus de Milo's, like all this other stuff that he just had. And all of that is what they're keeping because it's worth something, but tells you nothing about this man. Mm -hmm. Xanadu tells you nothing about this man. It doesn't even seem like he enjoys it. It's just all he there. It. What? Did he not even finish it? He didn't even finish it. He, he didn't even open a lot Susan. of the statuary and art that he bought. It was it just, was just all crates still in crates. Yeah. Right? Yeah. And that image, that final image of the movie of it just burning the one thing that maybe, there maybe and meant no one something to him. it said Rosebud and that's the word they were looking That for. was just a cleaner up. A guy cleaning the place out. That They just piled up a whole bunch of shit and tossed it in the furnace. And then that same pullout from the Kane estate disheveled and dark like a horror movie like sarah said when it first opened up that same opening shot just in reverse just it, it's just sad you you all you can feel emotion wise for this person is sad is all you really get well that brings us to the rosebud question um question also of what it represents but also where the idea of it came from as in terms of what it represents, I almost think it, it kind of speaks to materialism. And it's something you see now with this nostalgia thing of all these kids now who can go on eBay and buy all the toys from their childhood as though somehow that's going to bring them back their childhood. And it isn't. It's just an object. And it's it doesn't, fun to do. Yeah, it is. But I mean, it but doesn't really have meaning beyond what we And it's that same thing, the materialistic memory. <laughs> it's, you know, better to have loved and lost than to really loved it all or whatever. It's the not having it or it not being as awesome as it used to be anymore, that the memory really comes from. Yeah, it's cool to go buy, you know, the old Polly Pocket or whatever, you know, that you find on the... But when you were eight years old and you got that as a gift, I mean, I'm still that way with a lot of the things I have. It's like, no, I don't want to rebuy 
this Sony PlayStation game on this new system that came out on it. Because I, I don't care if I even get to play it anymore. I liked having the disc and like putting it up on my mantle when I had it out to play like it was on display at a store, which was something silly I used to do. Or that Ghostbusters Firehouse that I wrote my initials on the inside of and this thing that I dragged through the mud and blew its arm off and is, you know, whatever it is, it's yours. This is mine. And we don't really have that anymore because you can just go back and re-get it and rebuy it. And that's where the nostalgia really comes from is that there no other version of that figure existed in the world but mine. And that's what happens with this sled. We, we see in the first Christmas he has at Thatcher's house, you know that Thatcher is the only person didn't probably didn't see the name Rosebud on it, but he's the only person in all of his life existing anymore that would have been able to know that that sled was important because he saw him leave it behind with the house. So you see him, he tries to buy him a new one, and that look of just disgust, like, no, this isn't my sled, mm -hmm. like in his face, and it's, and it's very mentioned interesting. The irony that his that new sled is called the Crusader, which the is Crusader. what he tries to become later. But also this idea that, it feels like Kane kind of reduces the people in his life to possessions to some degree. Um, certainly the case with uh, Susan, where I she's mean, just she's, another piece of art that he bought. That he bought like, and yep, and the reporters that he bought there, as he said, uh, I I got my toys for Christmas. Yeah, and that somehow these uh, possessions that he keeps collecting have become have this greater importance. With they don't really, they're just collecting dust in all of his warehouses. But he still has to have them. This weird collector mentality. I suddenly have an image of Rosebud sitting right next to the Maltese Falcon. <laughs> Yes. Ah. And another thing that really is meaningless, mm -hmm. right? It's only the meaning that these it people put into yes. it. Yes. The Maltese Falcon's like just a symbol of greed. Yep. But there's also, you have to wonder, what if, you know, him saying Rosebud was less this big important thing and more that he's an old man who's starting to not quite have it together and was just having this flashback and all of a sudden it just, that was the first thing that sprang to him once mm -hmm. he saw that little snow globe. That, I mean, it and, couldn't, it might not be this big revelatory thing. Uh, Wells himself even later said that he thought, you know, the use of the whole rosebud sled was sort of dime store Freud, that it was kind of cheap and silly. But people love it. But it, it, it it's, it's, he in, wrote it. Well, but it's in the, again, he puts it in there as, hey, this is a good closure on this character. What's the reason the people are interested? You know, what's the thing he said or the thing he did? Because no one had seen Kane probably for a long period of time, you know? It was that Willy Wonka type of a thing, right? Like, what's been going on in there? And um, I think he turned into a hermit after a while. He was yeah, to he kind of withdrew within the walls. He was trying to take, want to face the public. He, he anymore. was a pharaoh. Mm -hmm. You know, I'm going to die with my material possessions and my wife, like right in here. You know, is what he's trying to do. It was that bitterness of the people don't want me to shape their opinions anymore and show them what's right. Well, fine, I'll leave them. You know, they can have this horrible, terrible world. I'm happy in here with my miserable people and all my collection of animals and toys and such. And oh, speak with all my miserable people. When she was saying, I have nobody, you don't let me do anything I want, his, like, completely disconnected, well, I had a big party where I invited all your friends, some of them are actually still here. You know, it's just kind of like, he, she, he just doesn't get it. This, is, this isn't what she wants. But again, also that idea that these people are just possessions, they're just here, toys to keep you happy, it doesn't have to actually socialize or have any greater human connection to it, just something to keep her busy and occupied and out of his face. Uh, the question of where Rosebud came in the writing sense, um, supposedly Mankiewicz did own a sled that was kind of similar, but also a bicycle that had gotten stolen when he was a kid that deeply affected him. Uh, when it comes to the slightly more salacious possibility, there was a rumor that it was a nickname for a certain piece of Marion Davies' anatomy, with the joke being that Hearst died with Rosebud on his lips. But doom Oh! Which is Shit just got real, ladies and gentlemen. Yet another reason that Hearst was really not a fan of this film. Oh my god. That's dirty. That would fit in with Whoa. Wells and Wells is kind of, you know... That's dirty. Yeah. Well, sense of humor. Somehow I could definitely picture him hearing that and going, yes, we have to use if that. you will, yeah. Mr. Laz. <laughs> oh. oh, that's dirty. That's gross. <laughs> also I need a shower now. <laughs> Well, let's talk about the, the big battle, the controversy. Um, while the film was being made, uh, Wells tried to keep the set completely off limits. He didn't want anybody to know what he was doing. James Cameron much? <laughs> well, uh, considering what he was writing and he knew the impact it was going to have, Hearst was an incredibly powerful guy then. Supposedly, there are rumors that Mankiewicz had showed the screenplay to uh, somebody who showed it to Llewell Parsons, who was uh, Hearst's head gossip columnist, and that kind of got the... The rumors going that Wells was making a film based on Hearst and 
started the opposition to it. And eventually, it got to the point where George Schaefer, who was the head of RKO, was offered uh, tons of money by uh, Louis B. Mayer, who was the head of MGM, and a bunch of other studio owners, to burn the negative. They were so afraid Holy that shit. if the wow. film got released, it would have such a blowback against Hollywood that they would be really in trouble from Curse Wrath. And i got to give credit to Schaefer. He said no. This is not spawning a war with South Korea. <laughs> oh, with um, North Korea. North Korea. The interview there. And uh, looking from <laughs> Schaefer's point of view, where RKO was in a lot of financial trouble. I mean, they had banked a lot getting Wells off of the radio to do a movie to put them back in the black. That was a very risky choice for him, and you you got to admire him for that. But the problem was, this was back when movie studios still owned movie theater chains. So the studios could go, well, we're not going to book your movie in our theaters. It's just going to incite a riot. Right. Yeah. I mean, originally the film was going to premiere at Radio City Music Hall, which RKO partially owned, and they couldn't even get that. So eventually, uh, Schaefer had to threaten legal action, to, alleging there was conspiracy among all these different studios. You know, Which kind of, I'm sure there was. Which there was, and they eventually relented and started showing it. But even then, I mean, the film's box office potential was severely limited. And when it came to the Oscars, there were huge voting blocks against it to make sure it didn't win to the point where at the award ceremony, it was the nominations for it were called out and its name was mentioned. There was a huge chorus of boos from everybody in the room. Hollywood wanted to make sure everybody knew, we do not support this film. We don't like it. And, and, and right? <laughs> Transport yourself. 80 years in the future, and it's considered the greatest film ever made. Yep. <laughs> so <exactly>. that's... <laughs> well, even then, I mean, there were a lot of great reviews. Well, not in Hearst magazines, but uh, or newspapers. Well, well, well. Exactly. <laughs> but in a lot of the other press, there were a lot of positive reviews for it. But uh, it just couldn't translate that into success. And uh, for the time, it probably would be a hard sell to the public. They don't really want this kind of depressing, not very happy decently lengthy movie about this rather unpleasant character and it's very complex it can be hard to follow it you know especially for audiences at that time that weren't used to that kind of structure in the movies they expected a very linear a to b kind of story some other interesting stuff about the movie one of the other great stories about hearst was that he allegedly very big emphasis on allegedly murdered filmmaker thomas ince on his yacht because uh, there was a rumor that uh, davies was having an affair with charlie chaplin and Ince got caught in the crossfire and was supposedly killed. Of course, this was totally hushed up. And originally, Wells had put a sequence hinting about that in the movie, <laughs> but realized, all right, this is going too far over the line, and he had to cut it. Too far over the line for this movie. <laughs> yeah, exactly. But um, Wells later told Peter Bogdanovich about it, which led to him making the movie The Cat's Meow with Kristen Dunst and Edward Herman, which is about that supposed incident. I mean, there's that great confrontation between uh, Leland and Kane where Leland is completely drunk and flubs the line about dramatic criticism. Oh, yeah. Well, you said yourself you were looking for someone to do dramatic criticism. Uh, criticism. I am drunk. <laughs> and you can yep. see Wells start to chuckle. Wells has this great big look on his face. But it, it goes perfectly with the scene, the idea that Kane is trying to laugh it off like, oh, fine, you want to go to Chicago and leave me? That's fine. I don't care about you, but... It's one of those perfect little accents. Also, uh, Wells, during the scene where he's chasing Gettys down the stairs, after their uh, confrontation in Susan's apartment, he actually tripped and chipped his ankle bone. Really? And had to wear leg braces for some scenes, which is why in some scenes he's not moving at all. Um, in the scene with the reporters in the opening uh, auditorium where they're watching the newsreel, if you look carefully, Wells and uh, Cotton and um, Edward Sloan are among those playing the reporters, supposedly. Really? Watching it this time, I think I could see Cotton in the background of one scene, because it's all silhouette and you can't see faces, but it looked like him sitting in the back. I'll have to check on that. And one of my favorites... It's like a movie made by my brother. I know. <laughs> and uh, one of my favorite bits in the picnic scene, there's the uh, projected background, and you can see pterodactyls fly by because it's supposedly a scene that they use either from King Kong or Son of Kong. That's awesome. And nobody noticed it until the last minute. Oh, they're shooting us. Nobody noticed it until the last minute and pointed out to Wells, and Wells is like, I like him. We'll leave it in there. They were really cool. It gave it an... Because that whole sequence has an otherworldly yeah. thing going on, like like another thing with the excess. It's like he can have... You know, we're going to go on a picnic. You know, that was like, you know, a bayou, like... Um... He has these other worlds within his yeah. little domain, yeah. Uh, let's talk about the influence that the movie had, which, I mean, is far-reaching. Uh, Francois Truffaut commented that this is the movie that probably started more filmmakers on their career than anything else. I mean, you can Well, you can get everything out of it. There's not a single thing lacking. You know, it's not like you can get some movies from that era where it's like, 
oh, this the script is just unbelievably amazing. The movie's pretty cookie cutter, but you got to see it for the script. This one, everybody's working on on almost like if we don't pull this off, this isn't going to work without this piece. Yeah, everyone type of a level because they had that creative freedom, they were allowed to experiment. Oh, Greg Toland said that one of the reasons he wanted to work with Wells is is he had this chance to do these experiments that no other filmmakers, no other directors would let him do on their movies, like you know the deep focus stuff, all these. Great visual tricks that he wanted to try. Here he finally had an opportunity for well, it. And like, for instance, the Xanadu sets. When you're in the outside of the house, it's like, I wonder where some of those bits were filmed. You know, because with the zoo and everything else, some of it is in the broad daylight. You know, it's not it's not fake. It looks like it's outdoors. But when you get to that great big staircase with the fireplace and that... It, I can't even imagine a movie now having a set like that. You know, it was just beautiful. Even with the extensions with matte paintings, it is a colossal set. And it's not even featured in a huge amount of the movie, but it exactly. really... Exactly. Or um, in um, Thatcher's library, the giant room that he has, just for, so so one person can read this one manuscript with this beam of light shining down on the table. It's so ridiculously excessive, but it says everything about these characters. Yes, uh, there's also the fact the flashback structure we've seen tons of movies and this idea of multiple points of view how they've influenced other films I mean Chris Nolan a lot of his movies use that though a lot of the his prestige movies in particular are, the prestige is filmed like this mm -hmm. um, a lot of the the fades to black where the lighting in the scenes fade first and, and uh, like he uses that a lot you know. Or um, uh, Akira Kurosawa's Rashomon is a big one. Where Throne we see, of Blood, same way. They do a lot of that. Yeah, but I mean, seeing the same story multiple times, and sometimes small differences, sometimes big ones. Also, I thought it was interesting just seeing the opening titles. The fact that, I mean, at this point where they were, people were used to seeing all the titles and all the credits of the movie at the beginning. And here instead we have just uh, the Mercury Theater, uh, Orson Welles production, question. Citizen Kane, boom. And then we yes. start the movie. And then we have the credits at the end, which is what we're used to more now. That was kind of a... It's something you saw to some degree in silent films, where it'd just be a title at the beginning, and that would be it. But it pays away a lot more for modern movies, where you just have a title, we jump right into the movie, and then the credits come at right. the end. Also, in terms of a couple more direct ones, looking at that last scene, oh, I, I couldn't help but think of Raiders of the Lost Ark, with the yes. warehouse filled with boxes and boxes of stuff. Except what's amazing is the warehouse is his house <laughs> at this point, and that's what makes it even more intense. You just see this you know, shot of all these crates, and then pulls back wider, and it keeps pulling back wider and wider. And it, it has that, uh, you know, the last shot of the house pulling out. They're burning all the stuff. And it has, it's now become his tomb, right? So it has almost like a funeral pyre type of a thing going with the smoke coming. It's like, this stuff is dying with Cain. He built himself a... Not burning everything. No, but a lot of it. So it, it, it's a metaphor, right? It's like, this is now his pyramid. His whole legacy of whatever that really means is just encased in here forever. It's like the Viking funeral. Yes. He's lit on fire and that's it. Yeah. Like, they might as well just be burning him with the way that it's shot, you know, and it... I was also reminded here and there of Oliver Stone's Nixon, especially the way we get these flashbacks to this very humble rural existence that kind of shaped this guy's personality and put this drive into him that he would never, ever be able to quench this idea that he has to have the public love him, but he can never quite pull it off and becomes this somewhat reprehensible character as a result. I wonder if that was on Stone's mind when he made that movie or not. But also his, the way he uses media in different ways. Like, if you look at JFK, the opening prologue of that, has a lot of similarities to the news of the world sort of newsreel at the beginning of this one in terms of laying out the story and the backstory and just letting you jump right into the film. Okay, um, new thing I want to try. Uh, what's everybody's favorite scene from this movie? Oh, Sarah. I need to thank so you can go first. Okay. Um, well, geez, th there's a lot. Um, a lot of the stuff in Xanadu, just because it's so otherworldly, um, but again, there's, there's not really great things happening in there. My favorite shot in the movie is is the mirrors mm -hmm. when he's walking away that last time, you know, from everybody. That that um, is a great shot. Um, I think my favorite scene is the entire sequence from when Cotton wakes up drunk, having written the thing, and then he confronts Kane and Kane fires him, and the shot merges into this black slice going on when Cotton's telling... Oh, sorry, when the girl is telling the story. Or was it Cotton? It was one of the two of them. I think um, it was Cotton, think it was Cotton telling it was the Cotton, story. Yeah. Where now the shadow in the scene he's in is showing 
still that sequence going on with Kane typing it. It just every all the dialogue between the two of them in that scene was great. Leading up to that point, it was a perfect representation of um, Bernstein kind of playing the both sides. That's when he said he hasn't been drinking all that much. To, and Bernstein lighting the cigar for him, even though Bernstein basically is selling him out at this point. You know what I mean? Or he tried to keep the peace, but he, and it's still that gentlemanly, like, you know, there was just so much said about the three of them when their whole universe, their fantasy land is kind of falling down around them. And I, it just says the most about those characters, so that's why I really dug that part. So you want to go, or should I go first? You go first or something. I'm torn because I absolutely love the newsreel sequence, because yes. it just feels so real. And these great, subtle, nasty jibes that uh, came during it, like the idea that he's, I've met with the heads of Germany, France, England, and they're wise men, we won't go to war, this being 1937. Or that quick shot of him on the balcony with Adolf Hitler. This yep. idea that he's, you know, backed the wrong people at times and had to pay for it. And just, it feels so authentic. Kane helped to change the world. But Kane's world now is history. And the great yellow journalist himself lived to be history. Outlived his power to make it. Or the great handheld shot showing a reporter probably crouched right at the outside of Xanadu. Showing his attendant pushing him along and in a wheelchair. And that's so such a nowadays type it of is. shot, it's right? It's a very like, tabloid like a, shot. A, a tabloid like um, TMZ, TMZ outside, yeah. parked outside of his place. And, um, you know, and to to speak to what you just said about that newsreel, it's so well done that you lose yourself in it and go, okay, this is the movie I'm watching. Now. <laughs> you know, it's not even this is a segment. It's like cool, this is how Citizen Kane is going to be. And it would be great if it was actually. I wouldn't mind watching a whole movie. Like they that. they agree that it's the best scene in the movie out there, <laughs> or the fireworks. So, or um, the other one that comes to mind is uh, the confrontation after Kane loses the election between Leland and Kane. The dialogue in that is just so good, especially that that final line of "Here's to love on my terms," the only terms anybody knows. Then, well, on the one hand, Leland calls him out on that. Kane kind of has a point. I mean, what else does anybody know about their own experiences to base how they behave? In the election sequence, the scene of him on the stage kind of leading that charge and like he's crazy at that point there's no more you know this isn't the guy fighting for what he feels is right for everybody this is this is a front the working man the working man and the slum child no they can expect my best efforts in their interests the decent ordinary citizens know that i'll do everything in my power to protect the underprivileged the underpaid and the underfed. And the people in the audience don't even seem that like rah rah behind it. They do when he sits down with this guy, and I'm gonna. But he's kind of alone. It's like now he he's not with them anymore. He's he's an icon. He's this product it's now. It's theater now. It's now theater. he's he's performing. What, what, what about you, sir? Um, I think I'm torn also between the scene with the mistress and the wife. Charles, you're breaking this man's neck would scarcely explain. This note. Serious consequences for Mr. Kane, for yourself, and for your son. He just wanted to get her to what come does here. What does that mean, Miss? I'm Susan Alexander. I know what you think, Mrs. Kane. What does this note mean, Miss Alexander? Oh, yeah. yeah it, is a, it is a great scene. And then um, the scene when Susan leaves and he trashes the room, but you can tell that he's not as spry as he used to be. He does it with like this old age stiffness. Yeah, the his performance there, the physicality of it is really good. Yeah. Uh, supposedly, he, um, you can barely see in the film, his hands were really bleeding because Wells really went for it in that. He went basically nuts, and they just captured it in a long shot and let him do it. And he wa uh, apparently walked away saying, I really felt it, I really felt it. He got into that scene. Yeah, you're bleeding, apparently. <laughs> and it, it, it does, it really plays off. One thing that I think it's kind of the perfect visual metaphor for the movie is after one of Susan's opera performances, when there's polite applause, but it's not enough for Kane, and he's plotting almost maniacally. And trying looking to get around else. like, you, where are you people? Why don't you love this? Yeah, it's the perfect representation of this guy trying to shape public opinion and suddenly realizing he can't do it anymore. Yeah. Not to mention the fact that it's now this famous gif you look on any message board or something, when somebody says something great, they use that little gif of him clapping with that insane stare. To represent, yes, we support what you're saying. Well, uh, my one thing uh, to, to end on, and it's probably a good time to talk about it, was um, right before we watched this, we watched the theatrical trailer. And it's a quick mention, but um, 
in kind of the same vein as like your Alfred Hitchcock theatrical trailers, it's, you know, Hitchcock would put himself in a room, maybe not even with any shots from the movie. Like in The Birds, you hear noises outside and, you know, a bird's kind of looking at him like on a stoop on the wall and he just tells you a little anecdote about the main character. This one goes the full bizarro world bonkers end of it with, um, you know, an empty, like, sound stage with a big light up in the edge, and you have Orson Welles at the beginning say, someone give me a mic, and this mic, boom, mic, flies in, and it's almost... It's it's either him talking into the mic, but you never see him, or the microphone is almost talking to you. It's kind of teetering a little bit. And then the mic goes through the sound stage and introduces all the Mercury people, but doesn't tell you a goddamn thing about the movie. But it still goes, I want to see that movie. Well, yeah, we get <laughs> these know. little snatches of characters talking about, talking about Charles Kane. Foster Kane, but never any concrete thing of who he is. My favorite thing from that trailer was the old... It wasn't the old publisher. What was he? The editor of the yeah. newspaper. Who... After saying the first couple things about Kane, starts sweating, and every time they come back to him, just b -b 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 -b, like he can't even get the words out. He's, he's so upset. Foaming at the mouth. Yeah. yeah, he's so upset with this guy. And um, you know, a lot of the film tricks, especially the tracking shots and things. I said that trailer had a um a bit of um tongue in cheek like silliness that even the rest of the movie doesn't have. The movie definitely has humor. A lot of humorous levity to a lot of the characters, but that trailer almost felt like a Wes Anderson movie to me, like the <laughs> Grand Budapest Hotel or something. Just these complete caricatures of even you heard lines of dialogue that were in the movie, but delivered in a completely different context. Yeah, a lot more broad and comic style to them. Right, and it, it was it's just fantastic. It was his own movie in its own right, you know. It's also interesting to think that to most audiences, Orson Welles would have been just a voice at that point on the radio, and I wonder if that. Figured into why he doesn't put himself in the trailer, that we only hear him narrating. Like, you gotta show up to see what I look like, people. Yeah, that he <laughs> wants to keep the mystery to some degree. Alrighty, I think that about wraps up, unless anybody has anything else. I think that's it. Okay, thank you very much for listening. Email your comments, complaints, questions, or suggestions to cinemaspection at gmail.com. If you're on iTunes and like what you hear, please subscribe to us. And if you have a moment, uh, leave us a review. We appreciate any feedback. Uh, we'll be back soon with another different movie to discuss and critique. Uh, until then, keep watching and have a good one.